Thank you for tuning in to another episode of In Range. We are doing a very exciting video today, and that's why you have all three of us here. You've got Ian, Russell, and myself. And the reason we have all three of us here gathered together is to talk about, finally, an update on the What Would Stoner Do project and the KP15 polymer lower development. So that said, frankly, Russell here is kind of the brains and brawn behind a lot of this, if not just inspired by us. Right. So maybe you could start off with the audience and let us know what's going on. So, I mean, part of the reason that why there's been quite a while since we've done any updates on this is mold development takes a long time. I cannot overstate how much um, intellectual labor and effort goes into developing a tool like this and the number of outside contractors we had to use to uh, gain the benefits of their expertise and knowledge uh, to make sure this product comes to market 100% ready to go without any uh, significant problems or defects. Um, if things stay on track, we will start shipping in July. Okay. Which isn't that far behind our original end of quarter two estimate. Yeah, considering a global pandemic, that's not too shabby. Which, honestly, some of our subcontractors did have their efforts uh, diverted because of COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, the molders uh, focused on uh, molding medical equipment, mm -hmm. and uh, the mold designers were focusing on making molds relative to medical equipment during COVID-19. Now, it didn't delay us a whole lot, but it was a little bit of a factor in the timeline on this. That said, in this industry, that's not that far behind, frankly, and it's also very important. People will remember, will not necessarily remember a reasonable slip date, but they will remember something not done right. Yep, exactly. So that said, the reality is we really started from scratch on here. I mean, you go back, way back, was it the 60s or 70s, and you'd know more about Colt tried to do a polymer lower. Yeah, Colt actually built a lower very much like this, um, didn't have the flared mag weld, didn't have the nice shaped grip to it. but. Um, they experimented with it back in the 70s, and they dropped it after just a couple of prototypes because at the time, the materials technology wasn't really there. Which, that doesn't sound familiar at all for this project, does it? It's very much a recurring <laughs> theme of everything we did with the original What Would Stunner Do 2017 project and now the Renewed 2020 is that a lot of the ideas that, well, originally Stoner and Sullivan tried to put out were a little bit too ahead of themselves. And then Colt trying to do a polymer one, they saw where the future was going, but they were a little way ahead of themselves in terms of material strength. Yep. So that said, what are we doing here with our developments that um, kind of compound and expand and evolve what Colt tried to do? So our design started with our billet flared magwell lower. Um, you know, our engineers at KE Arms are well versed in modeling and designing things made out of aluminum or steel. Uh, they aren't necessarily that experienced in modeling things out of plastic. So yeah. now wait, is there really any difference? <laughs> there's, there's quite a bit of difference in there. Okay. So we, we started with our billet flared magma and extrapolated the other features out from there. Part of the reason we wanted to use our billet flared magma as the basis for that is that flared magma in an aluminum receiver is a $250 retail item. But we can value add that flared magma feature that still allows you to use drums and uh, quad stack mags mm -hmm. um, while maintaining a MSRP for just the lower of $100. Ah. There's no, I mean, the extra material cost is zilch for right. polymer, really. And there's no extra machining time that goes into it because it's all molded at once. This is one of the cool things. Like, this is the trade-off of polymer. This sort of thing can be engineered into it. The downside is we can't really change it once the mold's done. Right. You know, it's interesting. It's actually polymer work and molds is not that different than stamping. Exactly. You, you yeah. make your thing... And it better work, right? right. That, that mold better be right, or your stamps and dies better be right, or you're going to have a problem. Right. You're going to have to redesign the whole tooling. So that's part of the, the reason that it takes time to get something like this up and properly running is because you can't fix it once it's built. Right. So our internal uh, engineers and design team like looked at everything related to this, uh, trying to keep it as close to mill spec as possible but reinforcing the areas that need to be reinforced that we can look back all the way to the Colt design that they knew need to be reinforced, like the fire control area having reinforcements there um, and some other uh, reinforcements related to the buttstock and pistol grip. So once he was done with the part design, uh, we then uh, worked with several subcontractors on different aspects of it. One, we had a injection molding specialist look over the part and redesign a lot of areas of it to be moldable, including uh, radiuses and corners that need to be able to be releasable out of the mold and also putting a uh, negative draft on the part so that it can actually come out of the mold. 
Um, oh, interesting. So you could actually just get stuck in there. Correct. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and all these things were kind of a balancing act that I was in the middle of. Like, there's what the part needs to do as a gun part, there's what the mold needs to do for the material we're selecting, working with the material vendor on that. There's the, uh, the expert we used for uh, tweaking the part design to make it moldable and releasable out of there. There's the mold design for actually taking that part design and turning it into a, uh, a mold. Mm -hmm. uh, and then working with the uh, welder company as well to make sure the part can actually be welded because if there isn't enough contact surface and sacrificial material between the two halves, then they can't actually be welded together. So for people who aren't aware, the whole point is this is molded in a left and a right. They stick them together and weld the seam up. Right, yeah, the both halves will vibrate back and forth and then melt and fuse together. So which means on each side of the receiver, there's uh, quite a bit of extra thickness added versus the finished welded part that's sacrificial material that gets melted and fused together. Um, so that was a concern. And then there's certain areas where it's like you, when it's welding, it needs to make sure that the, the edges don't fall off of each other as part of the welding process because if, if it falls off the edge, then these parts aren't vibrating back and forth and actually welding anymore. Uh, to that end, you won't see in the finished part because it'll already be trimmed off, there's actually a sacrificial part at the front of the mag weld as part of our design to allow for a better, more consistent weld. Um, so is that, that for alignment? It's for, it's for alignment of the front of the mag weld to keep the mag weld from falling off of each other as part of the welding process. Once again, strangely similar to stamping. You have yeah. to align the parts to be able to do the welding. Same idea, right. but in a different material. Yeah. So going back and forth between all these different subcontractors, you know, we, we did the ARP internal part design, then modifications based on the uh, molding expert to make it moldable. Uh, then we did what's called mold flow analysis, okay. which is a computer simulation that takes 24 to 48 hours to run a simulation of the material flowing through the mold. And that's like some deep math because you're talking about you have to you have to calculate in the actual polymer blend that you're yes. using and how it would flow through the mold through the process and what temperature and, and all of that. Yep, and they and part of that process was experimenting with different polymer and glass blends mm -hmm. and different gate locations. The gate location is where the polymer is injected into the mold. Okay. So uh, and and based on that data, there was you know a, a certain configuration that worked better than others as far as the plastic all flowing where it needed to, it cooling properly, and uh, the fibers knitting together properly. Wow. Um, because if it was flowing in from a different direction um, or a different type of material, those fibers wouldn't necessarily line up properly. Then you can have um, basically a potential fail point where the plastic's meeting together, but it's not actually knitting together properly and it's not cooling properly, and then it's a fail point. So running all these simulations we came up with the best uh, you know, compromise of the least amount of warp coming out of the mold, the best knitting together of all the nylon and plastic fibers, um, and the best cycle time. Meaning how many you can manufacture over X yeah, how, minutes? How yeah, how many seconds it takes to uh, run the mold. And there is an interesting uh, juxtaposition between polymer manufacturing and gun manufacturing. The polymer guys were dealing with are like, oh wow, the, the, the cooling time on this is around 60 to 65 seconds, that's horrible. But for us, from a gun manufacturing standpoint, where it takes 35 to 40 minutes to manufacture a forging into a complete 100% aluminum receiver, 60 seconds to mold a receiver is nothing. Oh, yeah. good point. Yeah. So that's interesting. So you've got people doing CAD drawings and design work that are used to working with aluminum. Mm -hmm. And then you've got polymer companies that are used to working with polymers that make things that aren't necessarily gun parts. Right. And so you've got to take what was essentially a CAD drawing of an original standard um, lower, which was an aluminum manufacturer, and then modify it to be a polymer design. And one of the things we talked about with the What Was Done to Do project, gosh, three years ago now, is that when you look at the iteration of all the different polymer thingies that have been on the market, that has to be done with polymer in mind. If it's not right. designed as a polymer lower from the go, you've designed something that has many failure points, and that's one of the things we're achieving with this design. Right. And even subtle stuff, like if you have di different thicknesses of material in the mold in different places, that can lead to warping when the thing cools. What do you not want? You don't want the magazine well to warp. You don't want the fire control pocket to warp. All of those things have to be taken into account in a way that doesn't apply to metal removal machining. 
Mm-hmm. And there's things like, uh, for example, the plastics guys were recommending like, well, you should leave more uh, material out of where the selector is, like below there, mm-hmm. so that it cools faster. Because that was a the, like one of the final points to actually cool in the mold flow analysis. Like, mm-hmm. you can't change those dimensions in ter- inside there underneath the selector, or you're potentially introducing um, problems with the way the fire control group is going to operate, or more room for debris uh, to collect beneath the fire control group. So, and that makes sense when you look at this. That's actually the, a lot of polymer density right there, right under the selector, for example. Right. So. Um, it is a, it was a balancing act to work between all these different subcontractors to come up with the design that met the design criteria as a firearm and met the best molding and welding criteria uh, that we could have. That's a really fascinating thing you're bringing up there because when the polymer guy says you want a void there so it will cool faster, that's actually the antithesis of what you want the design to be as a firearm. Right. So that's where, that's where you kind of came in and, and input came in to mitigate both sides' desires as what they're used to working in to make it what it's supposed mm-hmm. to be. Pretty cool. Yeah, like just something simple like that, changing it could have reduced the cycle time to half of what it actually is, which if it was a strictly a plastic part, you know, that it's may be something you want to do. But as a gun part and its design requirements of operating as a firearm part, it's not something you want. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a G.I. Joe action figure, but it does matter if it's a, a, a KP-15 lower. We probably should point out, by the way, that this is the 3D printed version taken from the same CAD file that you guys put together um, that we took to SHOT Show this past right. six months ago. So we don't have them coming out of the mold yet, um, but it's getting close. What is the what is the, the current status on the mold? If the, the mold cores and cavities are almost complete, and in the very near future, we'll be doing our first test cycles of the mold. So again, part of this mold design process, uh, we did not initially locate the fire control pinholes that were the takedown and pivot pinholes in the mold. One of the things we have to accommodate for is shrink of the plastic. And the plastic is theoretically going to shrink at three thousandths per inch, starting at the front uh, pivot pin going all the way back. So we don't want to locate the fire control pinholes in the mold until we know how much it's shrinking and in what direction. So if it's pulling, you know, down um, and to the right, we know that we can accommodate for that by locating that pinhole in the mold offset so when it cools and shrinks that it's in the correct location. Right. This um, might, well, go ahead. This might be a naive, naive question, but so what happens is when you cut a mold, you're actually then filling it. So what you're going to want to do is undercut the mold and then make it bigger if you need to. Is that what I'm hearing? There, so like, there, there are certain areas where it's going to, it'll be slightly larger in the mold. And there's yeah. other areas where we're, we're accommodating for warp that we know is going to occur. Okay. Um, one of the ways we're going to minimize warp of the two halves, because their tendency coming out of the mold will be to kind of fold in like this, is welding them as soon as they come out of the mold. So having the uh, welder co-located with the mold so that while they're still warm, they can go into a welder and help true each other up because they're both folding in like this and they come together and kind of push each other out, that'll help true them up to each other. This is really fascinating. I love it. And the comparisons, I can't help but keep thinking about the comparisons of how early stamping technology. Yeah. Like this is pushing that envelope a different direction and the similarities are very much there in that the goal here is to be able to mass produce a very strong receiver out of a different material. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And how what we're what you have to do is build the out like the inverse image of your actual part. You're working in reverse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple things that come up a lot, we'll just address it right now so we don't have to hear the questions all the time. The lower by itself doesn't come with a PDQ lever. No, it does not. Um, what makes this commercially viable, even though we hope to sell tens of thousands of what was sure. to rifles, is that it works with commonly available parts for anyone building their own AR-15 at home. So making it work out of the box with a proprietary part uh, that is relatively expensive. Honestly, a PDQ lever retails for $65, mm-hmm. which is the same price as an entire lower parts kit. <laughs> so if that void was there to use a PDQ lever on the opposite side, people would feel obligated to get a PDQ lever, and it would be a turnoff for the mass market. Um, the people buying what would stoner do rifles, I think, are the upper tier of educated users, where uh, you know there's a lot of room in between for um, lower level hobbyists and people wanting basic rifles at an affordable price mm-hmm. that they don't necessarily want a $65 uh, bolt catch in sure. their gun. Um, 
Well, and, it, it, and it is patented too, so there's no way around that. It has it has a pretty solid patent on it. Um, yeah, so if you want to use a PDQ lever, you have to get it from uh, the company manufacturing them. But ultimately, it does give the consumer base an option. They can get a KP15 lower, and if they want to do a DIY type thing, they could mill it just like you could an aluminum That's to put a PDQ lever in. That's what we did on the original What Would Stoner Do Rifles. It so. is. I, I couldn't put that on YouTube because of <laughs> YouTube. But yeah, I sat there with a Dremel wheel. If you want to do that and you're that kind of person, you absolutely can. And if you want it already installed with a PDQ lever, ready to go, then you want to look at the full rifle that's going to be offered by Brunel. So you buy the lower, that's DIY. If you want it all ready to go with a PDQ lever, you get the rifle. Yep. Or the carbine. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, anything else you'd want to add to this discussion at this point besides this is a big update to the audience finally? The, the second most common question we're getting is, is this going to be available in 80% configuration? Oh, yes, Just about yes, to yes. throw that one out there. For and the, there are a number of problems with that. Okay. Looking at ATF's past rulings on other polymer receivers, um, anything that has a seam through the fire control area is unlikely to be approved as 80 because it already has something done to the fire control area. So even if we made new cores and cavities that were solid through the fire control area with none of the pinholes, uh, the chances are because there's a seam between the two halves there that we then bonded together as they would rule against it. Um, there's also a lot of political pressure on ATF now, uh, to my understanding, to not approve 80% anything. So if it's outside the norm of what's already been approved, it probably isn't going to be approved. Now, if someone wants to fund that project at completely at risk, feel free to contact me. It's going to be <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars to go down that road. That's the other thing. We can't make an 80%. You can't make an 80% version of this with the existing mold because in order to work as a 100% receiver, it has to have all of the cavities in it. And because it's a molding tool, you can't just like not do, you can't like not or add extra polymer into some bits. It, it doesn't work that way. Right. Just like stamping, it, you, 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 make, you make your yeah. dies, you get your lower. You make your mold, you get your lower. Yeah. So, and the mold is, a, is the heart and, and soul of doing this. Theoretically, the 80% solution would be to have two separate halves, but it's not exactly a homebrew thing to get yourself a vibration no, welder and, and put the two together. And I know that in the past, ATF refused to issue rulings on uh, running one half of a monolithic polymer receiver at a time and then someone else running another half somewhere else. It, it isn't something they didn't they, they wanted to address. So uh, I can't imagine that would be any different today. That said, this is actually, truly, in this, this type of iteration of the KP15 polymer lower is truly a unique product. And therefore, the kind of regulatory controls that the ATF would want to do on this versus the standard aluminum lowers they're used to probably is untouched territory. It's weird. It's weird world. Right. Yeah. So... It, it is viewed as a firearm as soon as two halves exist in the same location. Okay. So it is molded at a licensed facility, mm -hmm. um, and every part of the manufacturing process is done at a FFL licensed location. But that also explains why the 80% is not a feasible thing. Yeah. I don't have any more to add to this besides finally excited to give an update to this project. I know a lot of people have been patiently waiting, and Brownells has been taking pre-orders with no money down. Yep. Um, and so you guys will know when this thing is out there, but we're not that far behind, and it's getting there. Yeah, it's been a little annoying. That, well, I mean, it is what it is. There's not a whole lot that we can publish for updates with interesting things to show during the process of, like, designing the CAD files and doing mold flow analysis. There, there isn't a thing to physically show you, which is why we have our 3D printed one from Chop Show here. Um, however, that's coming fairly soon. And I think once we have pro once we have the first um, pieces coming out of the mold, we're going to be able to have some video footage of that, aren't we? That's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Is, well, showing as much of the manufacturing process as we can without giving away any trade secrets. Yep, yep. So, and so a lot of that content, which you may remember if you were early into this project, will not necessarily be on YouTube, will be on the Brownell site right. or other locations where we can post it where it doesn't violate YouTube policies. Yep. So stay tuned to that. I'll put an update, let you know, hey, there's a new video over here that you can watch, which will be like the manufacturing process and video of this actual thing going on, which I think is really fascinating. Yeah. So for you guys who are watching on Forgotten Weapons, if this is a completely novel thing to you, which it might be, um, you can check out the whole project over on Brownells. This is the what would Stoner do rifle or carbine. Um, and we're all really quite excited to have it coming to market not that far away. Yep, me too. I can't wait. So stay tuned for more.